Welcome to the 10th Amazing Race 26 recap episode of the UR Team Number Podcast. My name is Michael Harmstone and joining me is the Canadian who doesn't know how to fake smile, Logan Saunders. Afternoon. And you can tweet us using the hashtag Yattencast or email us at yattencast at gmail.com. And Ben is having a little bit of trouble again. I hear that he overdosed doing math with the clown from this episode. That's what happened. Like the clown was just too, the clown peer pressured him. There are so many good sort of clown dancing screen caps that I could have picked for this week. Just overall, screen caps overall for this week were much more prevalent compared to uh, the last couple rounds. So many amusing little images that we see. I don't think we've done a podcast where I have got 14 banners lined up. Now you know some of what it's like for me when I uh, screen cap uh, episodes of The Amazing Race. Yeah, I, I don't think even the double week had this many screen caps. So, previously, five teams raced from Amsterdam in Holland, according to Phil. And as Mark Carroll pointed out to me last week, it, Holland is a province, it's actually the Netherlands. And they raced to Trujillo in Peru. In Trujillo, Blair and Haley and Jelani and Jenny celebrated getting a lead, but Blair and Haley forced again the next morning. Matt chopped his way through the roadblock, and former frontrunners Lauren Tyler had their bottom drop out at the detour. Blair and Haley won the leg, and Matt and Ashley were eliminated. Sad music. Wah wah. Yep, thank you for doing the Ben Powell Memorial wah wahs. <laughs> oh, and I, we're almost towards the end of the random Fitbit clips. Only the reason why this Fitbit clip was more amusing compared to past ones is because they said teams burned over 9,000 calories, so Fitbit is now in the Dragon Ball Z uh, arena. Logan, that can't be right. And also, something I noticed, the four remaining teams are all together in the titles. Yeah, they love, they love switching uh, around the title sequence quite frequently uh, this year. All four of the remaining four teams are, so, are sort of, I think, 7, 8, ninth, and 10th in the title sequence. There might be one more than that, but still. Conspiracy. Yeah, they all appear back to back. It, I mean, it's exactly like when they take that, they fly them all back to LA and take that picture so the winners are in the middle every season. <laughs> oh man, now that that's the biggest conspiracy one because that only applies to the past few seasons and I remember there's some guy online saying, look at the middle of each picture, the winner is always there, but it only applies to the past few seasons, but if you look at the first 17 or 18 seasons plus all the foreign ones that happened during that time span... It, the winner is never in the middle, so it's just this coincidence that's run on for only three or four years now. Aren't you aware of the fact that Bertram and Delise are time travelers? Yeah, they have their own little time machine, you know. Uh, I think Bertram imported it from, I think, a bunch of Dutch scientists uh, put it together. And they just go in there, it's like, hey, we gotta get the winners in the middle, you know. Rule, rule of thirds, rule of thirds is happening. We gotta, we, it's all about positioning. Going back to the, um sponsorship thing. Did you hear that Scotiabank have sadly departed the Amazing Race Canada? They left? They were eliminated? They were eliminated. It's now BMO. Wow. All the other sponsors, including your favourite Dairy Queen, are back, though. <laughs> Dairy Queen and Mentos. Yeah, Dairy Queen, Mentos, Chevrolet, they're all back. Air Canada, obviously. We need a Mentos blizzard on the Amazing Race Canada. Oh my god, can you imagine a Mentos blizzard? The brain freeze on that. <laughs> Eesh. <laughs> So, when teams departed the pit start, uh, they had to head back into Trujillo and find South America's largest mosaic wall at the university. Once there, they must find a clown who will give each of them a magnifying glass. Then they must search the wall, given an, an image of a part of it with the clue, for a sticker of the race flag which they can exchange with the clown for their next clue, after he, you know, pisses about with them for a couple of minutes. Okay, so we have to establish something here. Is the clown on meth, or is the clown on meth? <laughs> like, well, that was just some crazy dancing and twitching and everything, and the leading the shimmying and and almost trying to motorboat somebody at one point. Like, what what was up with this clown? The clown was very enthusiastic. <laughs> he was very happy to be there. Very happy. I don't. I don't even know if he knows where he was exactly. Also, did you notice uh, why Tyler said that they would win before uh, they departed the pit stop? Because they are calm and collective, as Rodney would say. They are calm and collective 99% of the time, but he's willing to get angry for the million dollars. Yes, the Hulk, the Hulk believe it or not, um, was, was his name, Bruce Banner is the Hulk? 
Yeah, um, I think he was on a version of The Amazing Race a long time ago that didn't air, and he was very common collected for the first ten legs, and he'd always finish somewhere in the middle of the pack, and then, you know, come the final leg, he just turns green and just bowls people over, and boom, he, you know, he wins The Amazing Race. I mean, he ended up killing the host at the time, I might have been, uh, I think it was Laird McIntosh who was the host of that season, so we just bowled him over. And he... Bruce Banner was actually an original participant in Treasure Hunters and shared the $3 million prize with his team of, of friends, codenamed the Avengers. Yeah, I hear uh, Thor loved to uh, dig through the sand pit. Fun fact, the only thing separating Tyler and Bruce Banner is that Tyler wears leggings in Peru for some reason. <laughs> oh, oh, burn. Burn. And it was Blair and Haley departing the pit starting first at 6.39am, Jay Lani and Jenny at 7.19, Mike and Rowe at 8.35, and Lauren Tyler at 8.48. This definitely isn't Amazing Race 24 when all the teams aren't departing within five minutes of each other. And also, what was Haley's biggest weakness again? Um... Her, her library and whisper voice. She needs to speak up a bit more. I love that scene because the editors obviously only put that scene in to say, haters, Haley's not that bad. She's actually pretty funny. She's very self-deprecating. Yes. <laughs> pretty much it was a point in our favor since day one. Yeah. We have a pretty good record on this podcast of cutting through the bullshit and getting to what teams are really like. And, yeah, I think our support of Haley has been pretty well documented. We are definitely on Team Haley, and to a lesser extent Team Blair, because uh, Ben stopped calling him a douche now. <laughs> yes. Uh, Blair is back in everyone's good graces. And Mike and Ro get the ropey taxi as well. Yep. The old flat tire. Or not so much a flat tire, just uh, no brakes working, which is probably far worse than a flat tire, come to think of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure those taxis were provided by production, so would Mike and Roe have actually been given a time credit? Boy, but they had no brakes, though. If you have no brakes, you think that would be a time advantage in your favor, because, you know, you're just you're just rolling down the Andes at that point. Yeah, but nearly crashing over a, a sheer drop in the Andes is a pretty big occupational hazard on the Amazing Race. Yeah, but I mean, Mike... With his pro wrestling background, you know, he's already suffered through enough concussion, so what's a crash, you know, 200 feet down the end he's going to do to Mike? So what you're saying is Mikey would be zeroed? <laughs> he would be zeroed, yes. If it was, if it was a big fall. If it was, a, if it was the type of fall, like, let's say, if you're in pilot wings and you're doing the skydiving mission, and all you're doing is pressing A to get the speed up to 1,000 miles per hour, then that's the situation where you would be zeroed. Logan, that's a fictional number, because it's over 900, and that can't be right. <laughs> yes. And also Mike and Roe get the traditional we-need-the-money-more-than-anyone-else confessionals. We always like to point it out, because, you know, it's usually a pretty big winner's sign. Is it a big winner's sign? Well, Amy and Maya definitely got it last season. Well, it's for, to fund all of their uh, ice cream research. Vital, vital part of vital part of science. We have so many student loans. We need to pay them off, guys. Can we? Just, can you just make this a leg we can win, please? If you want to donate to uh, getting rid of my student loans, uh, you know, email us at uh, yetincast at uh, gmail dot com, and you know, we can set up a whole PayPal account and kickstart up uh, getting rid of my student loans instead of me podcasting about the amazing race for uh, zero dollars for uh, over an hour each week. Disclaimer, 25% of the money will go to my podcasting fund. <laughs> and maybe my holiday fund. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pod fund my up fund an improved audition tape. Yeah, exactly. How about the first person to give $10 to the fund gets to see Logan's audition tape? <laughs> yes. And as well as the unaired footage of me pushing old people. If you donate $100, you get to have Logan drive you around the maps from GTA. Yes, you get, yeah, that, that, that is a great possibility. Which will mean absolutely nothing to anyone unless they've seen that video, which I did watch again a couple of weeks ago because it entertained me greatly. And we get the first of our two Lauren Tyler dick quotes of the leg, which is to lose a million bucks to Blair and Haley will not sit well. Is there really any doubt that Laura and Tyler are going to lose to Blair and Haley now? Yeah, I'm going to take back my statement, because this, this episode overall re really beat us over the head with the fact that Laura and Tyler, there's that because the producers are loving the com comedic value for this season, 
that there's no way that those quotes are not being aired without the intent to humiliate Laura and Tyler for comedic gain. As our wonderful friend Ben would say, it's schadenfreude. Yes. I mean, I've been calling for weeks that we were going to get the final four twist and Laura and Tyler would be fourth place. I'm not sure about them being fourth place, but I wouldn't be surprised anymore. They are getting the sort of Brooke and Robbie style, we need to win this at all costs edit, and that might come back to bite them. My gut is telling me that it's probably going to be a, a showdown at the end between Haley and Blair and Laura and Tyler for first and second. Which wouldn't disappoint me because I want Blair and Haley on Mike and Rose to win. Right, yes, yeah, so I would say that Mike and Rochelle are the second most likely chance of uh, winning just strictly based on editing because... That's really all we judge who's going to win is based on how the narrative and the story overall is going. I never really go by, you know, like a team winning four or five legs, especially this season where that doesn't really matter because there's no real favorites in terms of who is dominating the race because this is one of those rare seasons where everybody has won roughly the same number of legs where I think Haley and Blair have won three Laura and Tyler and Jane Giovanni have each won two, and then Mike Rudin and Rochelle have won one, so it's almost as close to even as you can get. Especially when this leg was so short that it was pretty tough for anybody to really blow their lead unless they had a bad taxi or uh, they had a tough time with surfing. With uh, Laura and Tyler, they've also had a go about Mike and Roe, which is something that makes me think Mike and Roe might beat them as well. Oh, saying that, oh, nobody really thinks about them and they're not competition? Yeah. Well, it's the second time this season that we've seen Laura and Tyler badmouth Mike and Roe. That is true. Whether it's joking or whatever. But that's why I think they might be fourth place. I am going to start up a petition to protest Laura and Tyler bad-mouthing Mike and Rochelle because I think that it's really disrespectful to all of the people that live on this planet and all of the potatoes that they grow. What would make me happy is if they have to refilm the finish line where Lauren Tyler had one, but then then get a 24-hour penalty for spitting on potatoes in Peru. And they then drop to fourth place and get shock eliminated. And then the other three teams have to race again to determine who actually wins. That is probably going to be the outcome of that petition against Laura and Tyler. But we're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, funny thing with Jenny and Jelani at the start of this leg is um, they said a bunch of interesting quotes where they said that they started off really hot and now they're peaking at the right time and they're just going to blaze through it. And I thought that would be quotes that uh, Jeff and Bracky would say. I thought it might be a quote from Sarah from Big Brother Canada. That is true. It's, yeah, yes, yeah, definitely the end of it with the blazing part. Uh, the starting off really hard and peaking at the right time is probably all of our interactions with Willow, I would imagine. I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to this week of, ama- uh, of Big Brother Canada because I do know who the HOH and the nominations and the have-nots are now. So yeah. this is looking good. What I found funny about about them being at the murals and with the clowns is just uh, just Haley's reaction overall to the clown, especially with the clown playing drums and cymbals at the same time and looking like it's having seizures. I found all of that just amusing with all that interaction between the the clown and the other teams, and even the clown who had nothing to do with the race and was forced to interact with Mike and Rochelle. My favorite thing about this was just Tyler's reaction to the clown. He was not happy. He really was not suffering anything. I am not impressed by your performance, and I look forward to not interacting with you in the near future. That's Tyler as GSP. And Mike accidentally knocking over his balloons as well. And the look <laughs> of clown disappointment. The knocking over the red and yellow balloons. It's like, if Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong were around, you know, those balloons would just be popped with the peanut gun or a coconut gun. But then, you know, that target's just taken away the second that Mike tips over those red and yellow balloons. And Tyler would obviously be Funky Kunk. Um, yes, with his Ray Charles glasses, yes. And once teams exchanged their stickers for the next clue, they found out it was a detour, which was shake your hips or make some bricks. And in shake your hips, teams must dress in traditional costumes and learn a traditional Peruvian dance of courtship, the marinara. Flavor and flair! Once teams complete the routine to the satisfaction of the judges and the audience, they receive their next clue. And in Make Some Bricks, teams travel to an archaeological site called Chan Chan, which does sound like a Doctor Who uh, alien, (laughs) and must first make 12 bricks to the satisfaction of the foreman, 
Then they must use a wheelbarrow to transport 12 dry bricks along a long path to receive their next clue. The archaeologist looks like Rick Regal, the guy from The Daily Show. And the bricks, you know, the... That whole civilization goes back over 900 years. That can't be right. <laughs> and Haley was very excited to uh, see this archaeologist, almost as excited as she was to see uh, to see uh, Hans or whatever his name was, the Namibian pilot. Hagen, as in Das. Yes, Hagen Das. I knew him like there's. I knew there's something ice cream related. Hans just doesn't sound right in my head, but I couldn't uh, come up with it right away. Haley was also very afraid of the dog biting her as well. Yes, the same the same dog that I believe chased uh, Brooke out of the the Russian babushka farms in the Amazing Race Seventeen, which does give more credence to our suspicion that Haley is a cat lady. Yes, not a big fan of dogs. If the dog bit her, she would be the person that would have a job working with babies and rabies. She'd be the Abies nurse. And we also got to see the brick judge be very ruthless and stamps on both her hopes and dreams as well as any bad bricks. It was such a Dwight K. Schrute type moment. Like every time that the guy would stomp a bad brick with his boot, all I could think of was, Happy birthday, Stanley. I have never seen The Office. You've never seen The Office? Nope. The American version? That'd be, that'd be your type of humor. I mean, that show originated from the British version of The Office. I am surprised with all of the 30 Rock and Unbreakable Kimmy stuff that you have never watched the American version of The Office. I was going to say, having said that, you know I love stuff like 30 Rock and PNR and Unbreakable Kimmy Smith. So yeah, I do have shows to watch this summer, but otherwise I probably would have given it a try. You would really like The Office. I have a Dwight K. Schrute bobblehead doll that is just right beside me. And I've had a dolly beside me for every single podcast. And I have a Lil Sebastian watching over me, as I have for every podcast. I have imposing like Simba on top of Pride Rock, okay? <laughs> <laughs> on top of my 3DS games. And Haley also asks Blair whether he's good at driving a wheelbarrow, to which Blair responds by, you know, dropping said wheelbarrow. Yes. Are you good at wheelbarrow? Oh, I don't think you are. Look, I wonder if, I wonder if when, uh, Blair plays Monopoly if just he just uh, is going to avoid the wheelbarrow token at all costs from now on because he's not because whenever he whenever he rolls like an eight or a nine you know he's only going to be able to move two spaces before the wheelbarrow token just tips and next thing you know he's just going to be stuck you know especially at the start of the game he's going to be stuck on Mediterranean or Baltic so if I'm Blair I would choose any other token uh oh spaghettios. I would choose the Iron because he does Iron Man competitions. Iron. And also, did you notice that Blair said hello to the dog on his way to the final delivery? Yeah, I mean, dogs dogs enjoy the friendliness, especially, you know, like, if I remember there was another petition, too, when Laura and Tyler spat on dogs from the last round. So there was a, you know, because it was just downright insulting. So I guess the producers told Bracers that they had to really do some community service and, you know, really make it up to the dogs of Peru. So Blair was really making up for it by, you know, just giving the dog a friendly hello. It was really, really quiet when they went to their final delivery, but all I just heard was, Hola, Perro! <laughs> As opposed to Allison and Donnie in the Mason Race 5 who were stuck with the, the dog... Uh, the dog walking task and just being uh, completely upset and angry and tripping over the dogs. Although, oh no, it was Cammy and Carly who tripped over the dogs. Yeah. It was Allison yelling at the dogs because some of them were having sex with each other. And unless the dogs' names were Jeff and Bracky, uh, you know, that just, that just does not jive well on the amazing race. So if Mike and Rochelle won the million, are they in fact going to buy the small town? I suspect so, yes. I just have a comp- speaking of monopolies, that'd be a complete monopoly if Mike and Rochelle, you know, roller derby and wrestling promoter, just end up owning a town within uh, Minnesota, Michigan. They're, they both they both start with M I and then a uh, consonant after that, so pretty close. I would love it if they bought their little town in Michigan and then went on to the Cowboys uh, town with one uh, streetlight. So that's not going to cost them much either. Yes, buy Jet and Cord's town with one. What's one light and it's flashing yellow and it's flashing yellow. Did did I tell you guys that we live in a small town in the south and it's flashing yellow? And we wouldn't have been able to make that joke if Ben was here because he would have been like, ah, oh, Jet and Cord are awful. They're horrible. Well, people. I mean, 
They 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 are, so Yeah, but Ben would have shut down the conversation as soon as he knew a jet and cord reference was coming. I'm taking advantage of Ben not being here by being able to mention people that he hates. So do do you think that Room Room is the international is is the international language for uh, drive fast? I wasn't aware of the fact that Vroom Vroom was something that is understood in every single one of the 206 countries, but, you know, makes sense. Tyler and Laura should just go to every country and test this out. Or use the kid from the Mazda commercial that just says Vroom Vroom, and just have, have that kid uh, tour around and just always say that, and then the taxi driver be like, oh, I've seen that Mazda commercial, I know, just to book it and drive fast. Do you not know that Laura and Tyler are the new hosts of Around the World for Free Season 4? Is that where they just spit spit on the ground until people give them money? Yeah, they're, they're following uh, in the footsteps of Parvati and Jess Roder and... Uh... Alex from The Amazing Race 2. He's, he pioneered that idea. You remember the pioneers, Michael. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember whether it was Chris or Alex who did it. <laughs> Chris probably w- would be able to have an easier time with that because all, cause he would just wear the same pair of jeans the whole race like he did with The Amazing Race 2. Obscure <laughs> reference. I guess I... Pe- that's right, folks. I pay attention to how often a team changes their wardrobe over the course of a month. Especially in Season 2 where it lasted close to 39 days. 39 days? 11 teams? The first season did last 39 days. Now it's like, oh, 12 shows in 21 days is the hashtag that Phil Kogan loves to use. And I'm thinking, bragging that the show only lasts 21 days is not really a a selling point because it means that you're doubling up legs in the same city. Uh, same, same city. Especially. Same spitty as where Lauren Tyler would be, Logan. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, because especially this leg where where it seems so unoriginal where teams open their clue and they, and they read, oh, go back to the city you were for most of the previous leg. I'm thinking, couldn't they have gone to somewhere else in uh, Peru and not just be like, hey, remember that? It's it's like it's like the scavenger hunt from Family Guy, where Peter distracts his family going on a scavenger hunt throughout Quahog so he can go out golfing for the day. And then he runs out of ideas, so he just sends them back to the same locations over and over. Having said that... This is the first time in 11 legs that we've actually seen a repeated place, which is a record for recent Amazing Races. Probably a record since, what, the Amazing Race 13 when they started that trend? Yeah. I don't think it's taken till leg 11 before. In fact, I know it hasn't. So I will give them a pass on this. I'm not brilliantly happy about them going back to Trujillo, but at least they didn't do it earlier in the season. And it's not like the leg really mattered anyway because of what... That was the big hint that I was thinking, oh, this is probably why it's going to be a Final Four in the finale again because they didn't really put too much together for this leg compared to all of the other recent rounds over the past five or six weeks. So it made me think, hmm, they probably know the teams are just going to be equalized heading on the flight back to Dallas, so they're not too concerned about what happens this round. We are going to be doing a further post-mortem of the season next week. And this will be one of the actually surprisingly few negatives, I suspect. Yes, I would say so. I am pleasantly surprised with how good this season has been. It's not Amazing Race 24, for example. It's not Amazing Race 24, it's not Amazing Race 6, and it's not Amazing Race 14. I'd argue that it's probably better than 15, at least, as well. And 16. Obviously, nothing's ever going to touch 17, because 17 is awesome, but I would probably put it top half of seasons. Top half? Yeah, I I could see a potential argument for that. Mid-teens, I'd say. Yeah. Certainly not the best one, but, you know, certainly not the worst, either. And did you notice what Laura's uh, lucky number was? Uh, No, I did not. What is Laura's lucky number? She shouted at the bricks... uh, Detour, lucky number 12. That's a very random lucky number to have. Is there any rhyme or reason to it? No, I mean, I could see, like, 8 being a lucky number, because that's Chinese culture, or 7, which is usually Western culture, but 12 I've never heard before. Maybe she's a big fan of D12. You know, all the purple pills, you know, or purple pills? Speaking of purple pills, um, that may be what the clown took at the start of this leg. Blue and yellow purple pills. As opposed to the blue pills that uh, Jeff took at Elimination Station. And Rochelle really can't fake smile as well. Apparently they didn't, they had no interest in sticking with the Brick Detour. Makes me, saying that the Brick Detour makes me think that it's some sort of sponsor task, like, 
in the past week with Big Brother Canada where they had a whole where they had a whole veto competition all about the brick. So it's just saying that oh they did this brick uh, detour. Uh, that's all I could think. I'm like, it's not a sponsor. They're actually just using bricks. I had to put in my notes deliberately the word bricks, not brick. Yes. To make sure I wouldn't keep thinking Big Brother Canada. Fun fact, in an upcoming leg of Amazing Race Canada, teams are going to have an active route info where they have to find the brick store in uh, Toronto, which has a recreation of the Big Brother Canada HOH room. Fact. Yes. Very much so. You can our 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 word is gold. Our word is gold, really. And we definitely have never lied before. <laughs> the brick is most definitely on the ground. Yes, and if you don't believe us, you can smash a brick like Laura did when she accidentally dropped the brick when they delivered the twelve. So they oh, had to go back and get it. After Tyler just that was hilarious that they put all those bricks together, made made it like cake, and which is the analogy they kept repeatedly using in. Uh, the Amazing Race 5 when they did the Brick Lane roadblock. Well, the cake is a lie, Logan. Cake is always a lie. And uh, just, you know, Tyler put together all that weight, lifting the wheelbarrow. He even sees the, 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 the gateway to hell that he has to go on this path and get all the way to the end. And Laura is just carrying a couple of bricks. And that, that made it sound like I was making fun of Laura, but I'm not. And she's carrying these couple of bricks and just cracks one. And they have to run all the way back. Without the wheelbarrow, just to grab one lousy brick. How dare you make fun of the human unicorn? She's carrying some bricks, and you're laughing at her. And that's rude. I think the human unicorn nickname uh, may not may not stick by the end of the season as we uh, hope to at the start of the season. She's been carrying bricks her whole life, and you're laughing at her. No, no, I don't think I want. I'm not laugh. I'm not laughing at Laura for the brick uh, part of this episode. I'm going to be laughing at her for something that occurs much later on. So, Blair and Haley are the first to leave their chosen diesel, which is Bricks. Dale and Jenny left Hips in second, Lauren Tyler left Bricks in third, and Mike and Roe left Hips in last after their fifth attempt. And teams must now head to Juan Chacho and search for Lennox Clue by the beach. This was the first time that Mike and Rochelle didn't really communicate, especially with the Brick when they were at the Brick part of the task. Yeah, I mean, I could, I can completely understand why they were frustrated, because everything went wrong for them. Yeah, they already put behind because of the taxi, and then they just, like, I'm not sure exactly what broke down communication-wise, because we only saw them doing that task for about 20 to 30 seconds, but, yeah, they probably needed to switch. In any season, I would have advocated that this leg would have been a non-elimination anyway, because it really was there wasn't much chance for any teams to catch up and they got a run of rotten luck that deserved a non-elimination rather than someone getting eliminated and i would have been really really peed off if they'd have got eliminated because of this like oddly enough the brick lane task in the amazing race five when they went to calcutta or calcutta or however you because the of the alternate spellings for the city that leg was also a non-elimination and that was when they had to lay 20 bricks but they didn't have to uh, transport them I think it would have been much more uh, severe to be transporting 20 bricks in in, in, in the heat within Calcutta compared to uh, Peru. I think in India it would have been well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit on that day. And just like in uh, Amazing Race 5's version of this leg, there was also an uned fast forward where teams had to shave their head. Yes, and I think it was... I think it was... I think Mike was... Mike and Rochelle did go for the unaired fast forward to get their heads shaved, but they said that, that Mike's beard also needed to be shaved, and uh, and Mike just drew the line in the sand right there and said, "No, no, no, you're not getting rid of the beard." Steve of the Sochi Love team has been envious of my beard this whole season. He is he he thinks he has a power beard. I am I am Mike uh, Iron Mike, and I, my beard is just so much better. And that's why Mike and Rochelle did not go for the unaired fast forward. And funnily enough, last season's fast forward was the first fast forward that actually occurred on a leg where the final elim- elimination point happened outside the US uh, since Amazing Race 9. Yeah, in Singapore there. That one's actually true, folks. We're not pulling your leg on that one. <laughs> that is 100% true. There's, it's only ever happened twice that a fast forward has appeared on a leg where the team who gets eliminated is the last team to get eliminated, not on US soil. 
Amazing Race 4 is the other time. That was with David and Jeff when they used it, and then John and Al got eliminated that leg, and that was Final Four. I mean, with the exception of, like, legs where Fast Forwards appeared on every leg, or Season right. where, where they, it appeared on every leg. But yeah, since the Fast Forward rule was reduced, it's only ever happened twice, which was BJ and Tyler in Thailand, and Adam and Bethany in Singapore. Huh. Yes, that is actually a fact. Uh, I think that's the first... Truthful fact we've probably told uh, on this podcast up to this point, so... Wash your mouth out with self, Logan. I've been talking truth for the past 42 minutes. Nothing but truth. (laughs) Nothing but 100% truth, kind of. So the roadblock at the beach was who wants to ride a seahorse? And in this roadblock, both team members must transport a caballito, a reed boat, to the sea. Then one team member must paddle it to a boy, retrieve their clue, and then ride the waves back to their partner. And Blair, Jaylani, Laura, and Rochelle are the ones doing the roadblock, and Laura and Rochelle are forced to do it, as Tyler and Mike have already done five each. Did you not like the other side of the detour? Because we haven't even talked about that yet. There wasn't really that much to talk about. The about. horses, the suspicious horse when Mike and Rochelle showed up to the detour was probably one of the funniest images I've seen on The Amazing Race in a while. Just that horse just did not, did not smell something right with them. It was like the horse had communicated telepathically with the zebra in Namibia and said, Oh, that Mike and Rochelle, I just don't like them. <laughs> Yeah, but apart from the confused horse, there wasn't actually that much to talk about. Well, I mean, the instructors were pretty amusing trying to... They were pushing the whole dating agenda much more than the producers were trying to do so since day one. Try and kiss each other. Try not actually succeed. Get as close to each other's faces, but don't actually kiss. It's it's. It would have been funny if it was somebody who was a big mathematician that was instructing them on the dance and said, oh, you, you know, you got to... You got to be the asymptotes of kissing, where you get so close but you don't actually touch. That's right. I brought a, <laughs> I brought a geometry or a, a trigonometry reference into this podcast. Trigonometry, bitches. And Jelani just couldn't handle that poncho. No, he sucked because of the poncho twice that we saw. And Rochelle just refused to fake smile. She couldn't bring herself to sm- fake smile for a million dollars. You know what's even better with Mike and Rochelle doing that task besides, you know, them. Messing up while we see that limp, the two horses in the background, you know, running about. That was that was weird. They kept cutting to the image of those two horses. By the way, the one that had the gimpy leg, and then the other one that was like a stallion. They're just riding around playing tag in the field there. But with Rochelle, there she she was saying, "Oh, uh, you know, I don't like to perform in front of large crowds and being judged." And I couldn't help myself but think, "Hmm, reality TV may may not be the best avenue." If you know how fans react to reality TV on social media. And also roller derby. Roller derby's not exactly a um, a private sport. I actually got to compete against a roller derby team at Trivia a couple years ago at a pub. And I crushed them and they were very unhappy. Yeah, and one of my best friends is a roller derby girl. And yeah, I would not mess with her ever. Because she would crush me. Well done, Beth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jen's probably a bit scarier than Mona and Beth, actually. And we found out a tidbit about Blair during the roadblock, and that is that he actually lives on a sailboat. And he does stand-up paddleboarding. Is he basically homeless? Because in the UK that would be the equivalent of living on a a canal boat, which basically is homeless. (laughs) I I don't know. I don't know what Blair's background is. He must really waste his money considering the job that he has then. Yeah, does he just sort of get a dinghy and and sail over to the ship where he's going to be docked for the next three months or whatever in the Navy? Because I hear that doctors are amongst the lowest paid people in uh, North America. And uh, Blair falls a lot of times, which is always good for screen capping. And Jelani falls a lot of times as well. But Jelani was preempted by the acrobatic kid before him. Yes, the kid that just does the random somersault in the air and looks like Blanca for a half a second. Blanca from Street Fighter. Yeah, not Blanca from Animal Crossing. No, Blanca from Street Fighter with just tucking the legs in and just rolling through the air. And oddly enough, Blanca is, is near, it lives near uh, Peru. Blanca's from Brazil, so maybe that's just, you know, that's just how people do in uh, South America. Roll through with somersaults in the air on beaches. I think Laura actually was the person we saw do best at the task. Because she did pretty well on it. We only saw her fail once, really. Yeah. Number one, have fun. Number two, be calm. 
Number three, which should be number one, keep paddling. Good old pep talk from Tyler. Just keep paddling. Okay, Dora. Dory. That's her That's her birth name. I think Dory's her nickname. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, uh, a Mexican explorer, Logan. And then we get to Rochelle getting taken out by the boat. Oh, 3,000 years old and uh, that surfboard still does its job. That's That probably happened to a lot of people with the very first surfboard where they just didn't know how to operate it and uh, Rochelle got a taste of what it was like to live uh, 3,000 years ago. How much do you hope that that is what the producers were wishing for when they came up with that task? Well, I mean, you had Jenny there watching Jelani do it and she's and she's laughing, and then she said, "Oh, you know, I, sh- I shouldn't be, I shouldn't laugh. It's not funny, but you know, it is funny, and we are laughing at them. They've been trying the whole race to get into the final leg, and here we are just laughing at them and their surfing of inabilities, and that's just rude." Yes, but yeah, I felt so bad for Ro when she was doing uh, doing the roadblock because she hit the ocean hard. Especially when she has when she has the word swim on her uh, left hand. <laughs> Something that I didn't notice till I paused it and went, oh my god, that is such an ironic thing. And once teams get the clue from the boy, they must now make their way on foot to the Virgen del Socorro to find Phil, not necessarily the pit stop. The last team to check in here may be eliminated. Did you notice the guy at the roadblock who looked like he had all but had like three or four cigars in his mouth while sitting up in a high chair that would normally be reserved for a volleyball referee. I noticed the the two lifeguards that were sort of surreptitiously positioned behind the races. But yeah, there was like a local who was just sitting up in a high chair just with like three or four cigars in his mouth. I don't know if they were cigars though, but like, oh, this guy's a champ. And in a shocking turn of events, it's Blair and Haley who win the leg again. They find the Virgin first, you know. It's just they have a radar to find Connor and Jonathan. Yep, and they are Goa Inc. to Goa. Yes, the place that was used for the opening location in the second uh, Jason Bourne film. Very pretty place. And Jaylani and Jenny are second, Lauren Tyler are third, and Mike and Ro coming last before your heart breaks too much. It's the final four twist, bitches. And they are the ones that we see telling us that teams must now fly to their final destination city of Dallas in Texas. Caution, somewhere before the finish line, one team will be eliminated. Did you love Jelani's limbo paddling during the roadblock? Where he looked like he was doing the limbo while uh, trying to stay afloat? If you were going to do that strategy, surely you'd do it on your stomach. Because then you'd get close to the water so you'd be able to paddle faster. Unless his paddle would have been right against the right against the boat, and he wouldn't have been able to use the paddle at all. So maybe being on his back was the only way to have the paddle in the paddle in the air and have any movement. Yeah. Um, also, Blair was the only one we saw without uh, who wasn't wearing a life vest. Everyone else was wearing a life vest when they were doing the paddling, and Blair was just like, "Nope, I'm not doing that." He's too cool for it. It's like the people in in the bars that get like soft drinks, but they refuse to use a straw. Like you just you just want to man up and just you don't need that straw. You don't need that life vest. Basically, what you're saying is, in Tyler terminology, Laura would be a lady boy, and Blair would be a lady man. Perhaps yes, that would that would probably be. Uh, not not a- appropriate isn't the right w- word to use in this scenario, but it is the fitting uh, terminology, I guess, if you want to integrate it properly into this season of The Amazing Race. And we got to see a major VT of all the teams going, why we're going to win. The UFC moment of the season. We haven't had these in a while. This was a lot more common in earlier seasons where it would happen for three episodes in a row where at the end of each episode it would just be like, Oh, we're gonna win. The others don't have anything on us. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna tear it up. We're gonna tear it up. We're gonna we're gonna crush them. We're gonna beat them. We're gonna win the million. I think we got it last season at Final Four as well. We tend to get it with the Final Three or Final Four of we're gonna win and this is why. But the quote that stood out for me was Haley saying, "We've got this," and you're gonna listen, right? <laughs> yes, that was just audio only when uh, Haley was like, "You're gonna listen, right?" As it went to closing credits. But I bet you that. That audio clip was probably taken from, like, leg two or three, but they just slapped it on there just to, for comedic effect with fans like us, and then uh, to anger the people who already hate uh, Haley, which is uh, fans like them. So, you know, everybody's a winner there when they edit it like that. 
My favourite thing about that whole quote, though, was Blair's laugh that was just played when she said it. It was just so knowing that he is going to have to pipe down and just let her shout at him if if she wants, because he wants a million dollars as much as she does. (laughs) So, next time. Monster Chucks, Cowboys, Abseiling, and American Football will all lead to one team becoming the newest winners of the Amazing Race, and there is a 75% chance that it will be basically split down the middle, because it'll be a blind date team. Well, you mean one person just isn't going to concede their their uh, half of the prize money to a complete stranger they've known for only 20 days? One person is not going to do a 60-40 split, a la Tim and Marie. Oh yeah, that, that was an interesting situation. Funnily enough, our last team of exes, unless, unless you count the blind date teams. So who do we think is going to win and who do we think is going to get mid-leg eliminated and join the Bilal and Saeed club? Well, that's nowhere near the same club. I hear that Bilal and Saeed were just the inverse of that, where they were eliminated halfway into the first leg as opposed to halfway through the final leg. So I would say that we're probably looking at a Haley and Blair victory 80% of the time with based on editing with Mike and Rochelle with the outside shot, and then Laura and Tyler are going to lose to at least Haley and Blair at the at minimum. I think they're set up for a second place finish, and I think Giovanni and Jenny, despite you know really uniting the people of New York by bringing the new dance to the dance clubs, I think that they are still going to. Uh, they're probably going to be the team eliminated in the middle of the leg. My prediction is Blair and Haley first, Mike and Rowe second, Jelani and Jenny third, and Lauren Tyler, the humiliating edit of fourth. Because I, I just think they're getting Brooke and Robbie. Do you think we're going to see temperature updates when they're in Dallas? I doubt it unless there's a supremely physical task that takes place outside. If that rodeo task is physical, then yeah. And I'll be very disappointed if the pit stop greeters are not either Jamie and Pierre or Jet and Cord. Jamie and Pierre being at the finish line to greet the teams would just be... That would be the most WTF moment, probably, in amazing in the international history of the Amazing Race. That would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and no one knows who they are. It's just like, are you the random 12th team that we didn't mention? <laughs> yes. You must be. Did you get start line eliminated? Did you have a pancreas attack? Also, on the subjects of Amazing Race Canada, they are back in Canada now, apparently. They've been to three countries, including Canada, already. And they're now back in Canada, and hopefully leaving fairly soon again. Interesting. Because I have regular updates from people on fa- Facebook just telling me what countries and nothing else. Did you like the spinning horses at the detour? That was entertaining. I thought it was a nice entrance for them. And uh, the one instructor who was very adamant, as adamant as the clown one with, with clown was with the shimmying, there was the one instructor who was very adamant for Jenny to have her chest out. Back straight, chest out. Thinking, wow, this is, uh, what's going on in Peru today between the clown and the instructor? So, anything else to add about this penultimate leg? Not particularly. It's, if, if Laura's prayers with, uh, Mike and Rochelle gain a flat tire are as effective with their prayers to win the season... Then, uh, then we may have Tyler and Laura just uh, completely shocking everybody with the victory. I don't think there is a terrible option for winners, but there's preferable options. I would love to see Blair and Haley win for two reasons. One would be that I've been supporting them all season alongside Mike and Rowe, but the second one would be the internet's reaction. The internet would go absolutely crazy. Be just like worst winners ever. They're worse than Freddie and KK Kendra. I don't think fans today even know who Freddy and KK Trendera are anymore. We would be able to send out some ironic tweets, though, at least. Like, I remember when Dan and Jordan beat Jet and Cord, and people said, oh, they're the worst winners ever. I'm like, guys, besides your weird obsession with Jet and Cord and how manipulated you were by the edit of Jet and Cord, um, did, you, did you guys not see season six by any chance? Because I'm pretty sure that Dan and Jordan had a completely valid victory and a very effective strategy while Freddie and Kendra were just terrible people in general. And also won the race by eating pizza quickly. Yes, that was the well, probably the worst final leg in any season after season one or two, I guess, where they didn't do as much for the final leg. But uh, yeah, it was just like, hey, you know how in Amazing Race 3, 4, and 5, how we stepped up our game with the final leg, and now we're going to do so for season seven and onwards? How about we just have you guys eat a pizza and then 
run to the finish line. Also, preemptive thing for next week. Please, can we stop having abseiling on the final leg? It's boring. It adds nothing. Unless you get someone who's a deathly afraid of heights. Like Flo. Or Micah. Who you know they're just not going to do it whatsoever. We've seen enough of the angel dives and the abseiling that, you know, come up with something better, please? Well, the thing with abseiling on the final leg is that you know, just like with Kelly in the Masonry Spore, when she did it with a broken hand, we also had an Olympian do a task like that on the final leg with a broken hand. So as long as somebody, you know, tweaks their wrist or just really messes up uh, or breaks a bone, in that case, we should see some abseiling because it's funny to see people in pain. The Logan Saunders guarantee. Yes, it's either it's funny to see people either in pain on the Amazing Race or if they're vomiting or both, like it, like Francesca from the Amazing Race Asia one, who had a fear of vomiting. So when she was ready to vomit, you know there was a big, you know, mental struggle there. So what about our fan questions? Did we get any? Yeah. Did we? I didn't know about this. Yeah, I posted the thread for it, and we have a we have actually a few. Fire away then. Um, I don't have the page up because I assumed you were following it, but uh... God's sake, Logan, you post these right. Just let me load it up. You're lucky I've got a tablet in front of me. <laughs> So, John McLaughlin uh, says, How do the actions of the film crew affect the outcomes? After all, they have to run to keep up whilst carrying heavy equipment. Has anyone ever blamed the crew for finishing last? Jan, go back to the Joe and Bill podcast that Logan and I did in January. They had a great answer to this, how in Amazing Race 1, there was a cameraman and sound crew that none of the teams wanted, and if a team got stuck with them, they would get infinitely slowed down. There's no time credits whatsoever for cameraman and sound guy being slow, but obviously if they get delayed going through customs or whatever, there will be time credit. But if it's just physical exercise, then no, because teams switch up crews every day, every week or every like. Yeah, like I think there's, well, Mason Race 17 has something similar to that with Nick and Vicky, where the maestro at the detour and just production in general had so many difficulties that when Nick and Vicky got there in last, even though it was a non-elimination leg, they made the speed bump null and void for the following round, and they forced an equalizer at the very next task at the start of the following round so that everything was level and nobody got punished for all the production hiccups. And not so much related to the crew, but there's another incident in The Amazing Race 2 where Blake and Paige were last to the pit stop in round two when they were in a showdown with Hope and Norm. And then because Blake and Paige's Jeep broke down, uh, Blake was adamant to uh, have a time credit so that they were saved for elimination. And because Blake was right that there ultimately wasn't a rule that elaborated upon this, Hope and Norm were eliminated. And then from season three onwards, you will see that the rule will change to that if a car breaks down, breaks down through no fault of the team, a replacement car is given, but they will not receive a time credit for this unlucky situation. Charles J. Fritz says, do racers have to wait on each team to clear customs before they can begin racing again? No is the answer. Yeah, we saw this in the Mason Race 3, actually, where they sh- where this was a rare time where they showed them going through customs, where Flo and Zach each chose separate lines for customs when they got into Vietnam, and Flo kept telling Zach to cut in, cut in line so that uh, he could catch up to where Flo was and so that they could get out earlier. But Zach, being the nice guy that he is and the champion that he is, just refused to do that, and then they had a huge fight in the taxi that was even aired in the episode about Flo crying about how uh, he wouldn't cut in line and that that's where... He, he drew the ethical line, and as Flo infamously stated, oh, Zach, don't try to be the martyr now. Susan Mitchell says, do the teams have a set amount of time to complete a particular race challenge? All depends on the challenge, is the answer? Yep. Some challenges, they it's like, oh, as soon as, or, I, or I guess a good example would be the Amazing Race Asia 3, where they had to do that mall task where they had to find the one Blu-ray out of a thousand that gave them their next clue, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but going through thousands of Blu-rays takes a while, and some teams got it faster than others, but one of the teams got stuck there for hours and hours, and another team, Maya and Oliver, were stuck inside the mall searching for the Blu-ray until the mall closed, and then I think they were given a time penalty along with their next clue so that they could just keep racing, and then the time penalty would have been applied if they ever made it to the pit stop. 
which they didn't because they had other troubles on that leg. One that I know wound you up was Amazing Race Asia 4, I believe, with the roadblock where teams had one try and then got a four-hour penalty. Yes, where they, it's like, if you cannot complete where the task was that they were scuba in a scuba suit and they had to work a key through a net, it was a very survivor-ish type challenge. Yeah. And if they couldn't work through it within 10 minutes, I think it was, then they would get a four-hour penalty once they got to the pit stop. So there, there is crazy situations like that where I'm guessing it's all to do with logistics and how long a place can be open or closed or or uh, how much they can have one person attempt a certain task. But there, there can be time limits from time to time on uh, how long you're allowed to be given to complete a task. Yeah, ultimately, it all depends on whether, the, usually whether the task is reliant on daylight or reliant on a place being open. If it's out in the open and daylight's not required for it, they can go on as long as they want. But obviously, if it gets to the point where all the teams have checked in, then there's no point that team continuing racing, and if it takes forever and Phil has to go somewhere, then they'll eliminate them in the field. Another good one is with the Mason Race 12, an actual American example, is when they did the the dancing task in Burkina Faso where if they all, they were only given one attempt as well and if they failed then that was a 15 minute penalty. What about the one in American Age 21 in Russia with the synchronized swimming task? Oh, what was that one again? That was the detour in Russia where Josh and Brent got the penalty for not completing the task before the swimming pool had to had to close. Uh, Susan also says it's uh, how long does the race take from start to finish for the contestants? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, hashtag 12 legs 21 days is the current one, but it has been 39 days before. And is the editing done as they go, or is the editing done at the end of the completed race? As far as I know, it's done after they come home, but I wouldn't be surprised if they start doing it a little bit earlier to get a head start on it. Because if you consider that this race finished in December, is the week before the Amazing Race 20. Five finale, and we then had the preview. So they must have done some editing as they were going along, actually. Um, do you think Blair and Haley would have broken the record for first place finishes if he just listened from Heather McDonald? They would have won. Uh, what was it? That one leg in Thailand. If Blair would have read the menu, then Haley and Blair would have been first on that leg instead of. Was that the leg that Kurt and Bergen finished first? I thought it was the Mike and Row one. Oh, the Mike Rochelle, yeah, that was the Mike Rochelle victory. Kurt and Bergen were Bangkok, but Mike and Rowe were the one in Phuket. So, uh, they wouldn't have broken the record, because that's currently still stands at eight, as far as I know. Yeah, eight victories in 12 legs, or 13 legs. They would have won another prize, yeah. So, anything else to add? Um, other than, I think, I really, if we were doing this on, uh, on Google Hangouts, this is the part where I would imitate Tyler doing the slow motion throwdown of the of the brick. Maybe for our next video podcast, Logan. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> so, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back for our final Amazing Race podcast of the season next week. If you enjoyed the show, and even if you didn't, please give us a like on YouTube. And if you want to see what we're rumbling about this week, our Twitters are in the description down below on the video. Also, if you are following Big Brother Canada 3, please join us. We do cover that every single Friday after the evictions are on Wednesday nights. Thank you again. Hashtag 250, hashtag super cool wacky. Peace. And also, one last note, next week I will be confirming who our next interview subjects will be, and it is a good one. So make Ooh. sure to join us. Ooh. A tease. <laughs> I'm a tease. <laughs> okay, Bracky. I'm not that sort of tease. <laughs> we do potentially have three more interviews coming before we start Amazing Race Canada. See you next week.